roll. Roll! Snake eyes. No, that's too bad. G.I. Joe Snake Eyes is the latest $90 million effort from Paramount to rebuild the toy movie empire it once had with Bayformers. Pretty unsuccessfully so, considering that it lost its box office weekends to a $10 million M. Night Shyamalan film. Meaning that when it comes to money, Snake Eyes the movie doesn't feel so good. And as you start looking into why this movie would fail so badly at the box office, one interesting notion you can come across is that the audience it exclusively caters to simply doesn't exist anymore, not to the extent needed to cover such a price tag, that audience being little kids. See, Snake Eyes the movie does offer enough to logically warrant at least a certain amount of returns. It's got cool action, it's got a cool foreign setting, it's got cool CGI monsters, you know, it carries enough of a recognizable blockbuster brand to at least outperform a low-budget M. Night Shyamalan mediocrity. And yet it didn't, because all that offered coolness and brand recognition in practice is handled in such an idiotic way that's very difficult for anyone outside of little kids to enjoy. And little kids of today, they don't really go see movies anymore. If it's not a major part of our culture like Marvel, they're too busy devouring content 15 seconds at a time anywhere they are. And what I mean with kid-like idioticness is, for example, the fact that the characters in this movie aren't really characters as much as they are vessels for the story to control in any way it needs. A scene with a boy and his father is less about their relationship and more about hammering in where we are. Is there a safe? At the cabin. Why? Where they want to steal your baseball cards? <laughs> no. I heard you on the phone the other night. You said you were at a safe house. A moment of one of the good guys realizing that our betrayer hero is actually a good guy as well happens as if with a press of a bun. Did you see that? Snake fighting on our side. And so with this same mindset, let's jump into my notes on Google Drive, which I'm sure won't come back later in the video, to look deeper into how exactly G.I. Joe Snake Eyes ruins everything it has to offer by limiting its appeal exclusively to little kids. Not only to see why that's not such a great idea in this day of age anymore, but also to see how a few tiny practical changes in terms of that exclusivity would have made this movie not necessarily a hit, but at least a bit less of an unappealing flop. The first children exclusive issue here is how all the cool events and moments this movie offers in practice are so nonsensical and unearned that it kind of reduces that coolness to zero. A great example of this you'll find in the opening, where young Snake Eyes is hiding out with his dad until suddenly a contract killer shows up with a couple goons to do a hit. Instead of just killing the dad on the spot, the killer challenges him to a twisted game of dice for his life, which then of course ends in the dad rolling. Snake Eyes. No, that's too bad. Wait, 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 wait. Hey. Wait, wait, wait. And on paper, this dice moment is pretty useful, because it essentially assigns some actual meaning and purpose to the name that Snake Eyes adopts. But the problem is that in practice, it doesn't make a lot of sense. First off, the killer never even rolls the dice himself, so how can the dad lose a game that isn't finished? And more importantly, the dice thing as a whole seems more like a momentary contrived gimmick than an actual organic character trait. Harvey Dent's whole personality is built on the duality of choice that he needs his coins help with, whereas this is just a dude who randomly wants to roll dice for no real motivated reason and with no real established larger point because he's working for someone else and so it's not even his choice to make. Here is how I make decisions. Win, you live. Lose. And you can just kill me. You know, this name origin might seem cool for little kids, but for anyone over the age of 7 who has seen more than 7 movies, not so much. And you'll find similar cases all throughout the film. When adult Snake Eyes is working for the Yakuza to find his dad's killer in the beginning, there's this big twist where his co-worker is actually a future leader of one of Japan's most powerful clans. My cousin here is one of Japan's most powerful sons. 
He's an undercover spy acting out of loyalty to his precious clan. Which is cool and all until you realize how weird it is that the only remaining blood successor to an ancient dynasty I'm the last of the Arashkali bloodline is going out on undercover missions alone. You know, no matter how cool and exciting these Tokyo fight sequences might be, it is always a bit strange that we have this massive all-powerful clan and yet the only members ever going out to fight for it are its future leader and his head of security. In other words, imagine Raz al Ghul but he hides his identity to get in unnecessary danger and never uses his man. Awesome team. No. I'll handle this myself. You've lost an army, Tommy. But I can get you a better one. Stop. We have Snake Eye secretly sneaking around Tokyo and the clan premises, which is made inexplicably easy because of the full freedom he's given to come and go as he pleases, as well as because there seem to be cameras only when it's convenient for the story. Yes. Bye, have a great time. We have these cool outside-the-box initiation challenges, which can be failed or overcome by simply standing there and hearing revelationary voiceover that we set up like three minutes ago. You must take my ball without spilling any Water. Selflessness and truthfulness. We have this crazy supernatural superpowered MacGuffin stone that everybody wants, which ultimately could be replaced by an ordinary gun. I'm sure you get the idea and you can watch the film for more, but the best example that really hammers in the point I'm trying to make is the second act ending where Snake Eyes finally meets the killer of his dad to finally find out the truth that Why did you kill him? Cobra gives an order, you don't question it. Again, this moment of turning the sides on their head is okay on paper, but not so much in practice. If the bad guys know that they ordered the dad's death, why the hell would they just let Snake Eyes go talk alone with the one person who can reveal the truth to him? That doesn't follow any logical sense. It just ruins the very message that the whole purpose here is to get across. I have to stop Kenta. And so if you want to have moments like this, you have to make them function practically. For example, what if instead of just leaving the killer for Snake Eyes to talk to, the bad guys have actually set up an ambush and want the killer to take care of Snake Eyes the same way he did with the dead, leading to a battle 20 years in the making. This specific alternative is the most obvious choice and perhaps not the right one, but the main point is to present the event of Snake Eyes finding out the truth in a more practically functional way. In a way that can be enjoyed not only by idiot kids, but also by viewers capable of thinking. The second part of this kid issue here is the fact that despite all the loud, exciting stuff happening on screen, not much is actually happening. For the first 40 minutes, for example, our main hero Snake Eyes is a blank passive shell who just gets moved around by the story. He spends his days prize fighting for money until the Yakuza boss shows up to offer him a job in exchange for the identity of his dad's killer, which he accepts without any evidence, of course. Come walk for me, and I promise you, I'll find a man who did this. Okay. He then spends his days working as a fishman for the Yakuza until a co-worker turns out to be the future leader of the Japanese clan, who he decides to help for no established reason other than he's just a good guy like that, of course. I'm not a murderer. I owe you a blood debt. We are going home. Okay. He then spends his day being flown to the clan's home and being invited to be part of it, with no motivated say in the matter himself, of course. And will he submit to the challenges? He will. Okay. Overall, the entire first act of the movie is without any discernible progress in terms of completing our hero's main goal, which in the eyes of audiences old enough to understand what motives and goals are makes it pretty boring. The turn, however, comes at the 40 minute mark when it's revealed that Snake Eyes actually still works for the Yakuza boss and has infiltrated the clan to steal the MacGuffin stone in exchange for information about his dad's killer. And even though this is a major improvement, that same lacking sense of progression still very much remains. See, the main driving force of the second act is the trio of challenges that Snake Eyes has to complete to become part of the clan. And the issue is that completing these challenges doesn't get us any closer to fulfilling our main 
goal of getting the stone in exchange for our dad's killer. Because as the movie quickly establishes, Only a few have access. My grandmother, the masters, and me. And so then, what's the point? What's the point of becoming closer with the clan if we can already move around as we please? What's the point of completing the challenges if that doesn't get us any closer to the stone? What's the point of waiting around to fulfill these mini goals today if that doesn't directly help us fulfill our main goal tomorrow? I understand that Snake Eyes is forced to take part in these challenges so he can stay and continue looking for the stone, but if all they are is something he just has to take part in, then all they also are is something the audience just has to watch. Request that you accept my ball in exchange for yours. And consider the tiniest change to maintain a consistent sense of progress. The change of establishing that by completing the challenges and becoming a member of the clan, Snake Eyes will then be informed of the stone's location so that he can become its honorary protector. Now, completing the challenges is part of our main journey. Now, each challenge completed is a step closer to the stone and our dad's killer. Now, we're always clearly running towards something as opposed to everyone once in a while stopping to run in place. To be fair, there exists a sense of progress here in form of getting clues to the whereabouts and security of the stone, as well as keeping the knowledge of our dad's killer's identity alive, but if the main central purpose of the second act revolves around overcoming challenges that don't get us any closer to where we're going... Uh-oh. This gets a lot better in the third act when Snake Eyes generates a driving motive to save the clan from his own mistakes, but again, it's a bit weird how the climax comes down to chasing the Yakuza bus. Like, this guy isn't behind his dad's death, he's only working with the people who are. Wouldn't it make more sense for us to be chasing the Cobra Lady instead? Or if you wanna save her for the sequel, fair enough, but then establish some clear finish line reason for why we specifically have to stop the Yakuza boss even though he's already defeated. Like for example by revealing that he actually had something to do with our dad's death or that his plan of attack still isn't over. Cause otherwise we're doing all this running and chasing without actually moving, which might go unnoticed by little kids, but not by anyone else. Uh, oh my god, it just signed me out of Google Drive again. How does this keep happening, guys? <laughs> Give me a sec, I need to get back in to be able to finish the last part of the video. I just have to ask for a new password because I use different ones for different sites because there was this breach once and... Uh, oh right, my password manager, it can order filled for me. Hell yeah! Real lifesaver, this NordPass password manager, huh? It securely stores all your logins in one vault that you can access with a single master password and this way eliminates the need to remember each login for every site. A lot safer than storing them in your browser or on a node on your desk or just using the same password everywhere. It can even generate complex uncrackable passwords for you. It lets you share them safely. Overall, it encrypts and watches over your logins and credit card details and can order fill it for you to make life a lot easier. I get that it's difficult to value something like this until after the bad thing has already happened, but if you want to be truly safe in this era of digital currency, NordPass is sponsoring a special Filmento discount of 74% off with 4 months for free, and they even put up a fully free version that you can try out first. Go to nordpass.com slash Filmento or use code Filmento to see more. And now, back to it. The third child issue with this movie is that it's very one-dimensional in the way of what you see is what you get. Not only in terms of individual on the nose characters and dialogue like I already touched on, but also on a much more fundamental level. To introduce this point, look at the beginning sequence where Snake Eyes has been hired into the Yakuza. He's just doing his normal thing as per usual when suddenly something's wrong. Boss wants to talk to you. My trouble? Someone is. Leave the knife. Right, so essentially this movie tries to create tension through the Yakuza bus knowing about a traitor in their ranks, which we're supposed to fear is Snake Eyes. Without trust, there can be no loyalty. And without loyalty, 
And the reason this tension and sequence as a whole doesn't work is because it doesn't exist beyond what's there on screen right now. We have no reason to fear for Snake Eyes because all we've seen so far is him getting hired by the boss. I'll find a spot for you in my crew. We have no reason to care about the clan prince who ultimately ends up being the traitor because we literally just met him. Wish boy. And yet, that's exactly what the movie expects us to do, cause we're just a bunch of little dumb kids who need nothing more to be impressed than loud noises and fast images. To be fair, the movie bases this loyalty moment on a tiny situation before where Snake Eyes de-escalates a confrontation with little kids, but the issue is that it doesn't really connect to loyalty and trust, and we still know he's been hired by the main boss so who cares. To better explain what I'm getting at, consider a version of the same sequence that plays with information beyond just what's on screen right now. What if we skip the whole Yakuza boss recruitment scene and instead open the story after the prologue at the docks? You know, we're seeing adult Snake Eyes work for the Yakuza and we're wondering why he's doing that until we somehow then realize that, oh, he's actually secretly here in search of his dad's killer. On top of which, we can also at the same time spend our extra time to develop an actual relationship between him and his work friend who we don't yet know is the clan prince in disguise. And now that we've spent that time establishing all this stuff beforehand, the exact same scene plays out very differently. Now that we hear about a possible traitor, we have an actual reason to fear for Snake Eyes because we know him to be a liar who has infiltrated this place. Now that the clan prince turns out to be an infiltrator as well, we have an actual reason to care and fight for him, because we've built a relationship with him. Now, it isn't just the single dimension of what happens in the moment, but also what's there beyond it. Just because you left me to bleed out on a dock in LA? All you had to do was get Tommy on the boat. Very useful lesson to learn already, but where it gets really interesting is when the movie does this exact thing later on, with Snake Eyes actually having worked for the Yakuza boss all along, and for some reason it still doesn't work. We know that Snake Eyes is lying to the clan, and yet we don't really dread that lie being exposed. We know that he's surrounded by an army of warriors, and yet we don't really fear for his safety. I mean, it gets to the point where he's facing off with giant deadly snakes, and it's still difficult to believe these people would actually let something bad happen to him. And as I was trying to figure out why that is, turned out it's because that same single dimension issue still appears on the most fundamental level. See, the people Snake Eyes works for, they're very clearly painted as the bad guys. They're terrorists and criminals who seek death and destruction in a way that Snake Eyes wants no part of. You're right about that, because I'm out. I didn't sign up to work for terrorists. No. I didn't sign up for this. And then on the other side, you have... The good guys. They're nice, they're friendly, and despite some occasional talk about harsh punishments for failure, they don't really ever act according to that talk. I mean, Snake Eyes gets found out twice, and both times, it's just shrugged off. So... so what? Your honesty wins you your life. <laughs> And this is probably the biggest lesson movies like G.I. Joe Snake Eyes should take from it. The world of toys and cartoons can be good and bad because that's how little children see things. But when you bring that world to the real one, it can't be binary anymore. It can't be black and white. If you want your audience to emotionally partake in the moments of Snake Eyes' secret almost being exposed, the penalty of lying is death then you need to establish consequences to those moments outside of them. Convince the audience that the good guys aren't just good guys. I mean, even freaking performers figured this out. Because if you don't, if you maintain that one-dimensional childlike worldview of the toys where what you see is what you get, where the bad guys are bad because they're bad and the good guys are good because they're good, odds are that it will appeal exclusively to little children. And as we see here, they're starting to be way too few of them going to the theaters anymore to pay back a budget of 90 million dollars, which in turn then leaves movies like this pretty much just one probable outcome. No, that's too bad.